Okay, so we are at the San Francisco Drupal Users Group. Um, some housekeeping and expectations for tonight. Um, this is being recorded, so everyone knows. Um, I will ask that participants stay muted during the presentation. Um, that way we don't have a lot of ambient noise in the background. Um, I want people to be mindful if they do unmute themselves of the background noise and mute as soon as they can. Um, virtual backgrounds are perfectly fine, but no blinking lights and flashing and things waving around because we do have some visitors to SF Doug that live with um, vision um, induced motion sickness. So we just wanna be mindful for all of our people. Um, and be nice, be respectful, which leads us into the code of conduct, which is that the SF Drupal users group seeks to provide a friendly, safe environment. And we encourage all participants participants to engage in healthy and productive dialogue. Um, we just want everyone to be nice. We want everyone to adhere to the Drupal Code of Conduct, um, and that's our Bad Camp Code of Conduct. Um, and this applies to all interactions, um, whether it be video, um, chat messages, or any Slack slacks that go on. So um, be nice, abide by our Code of Conduct. In the Drupal news, um, I just pulled out a couple from maybe the last couple of days. Um, Gabor Hortze put together a nice blog article for folks going to DrupalCon or for people watching the videos afterward. It talks about um, all of the different sessions and boffs available um, for Drupal 9 sessions. So that's really a, a good thoughtful list put together. And then Matt Glayman um, put together a blog post called the new issue forks functionality is going to be awesome. And what he did there was there's this new feature in Drupal for forking functionality. Um, this is in beta and project managers need to opt into this um, to get the functionality. But um, at the moment for those projects, you can just hit a button and create a repository fork for an issue, create a branch and then commit to that branch. So it's much like what the workflow will be like when we have everything up on GitLab with the merge requests versus the patching. Um, I haven't come across any in the wild that have this yet, um, so I haven't tried it out, but the article is really nice. And tonight, it's Alyssa Thomps Thomas with Oomph Incorporated. She's going to do a deep dive technical talk covering a case study for a client um, who needed to launch a web contest. Um, they use the voting API for the framework. Um, and she's going to talk about all of the, the missing pieces and, and how to fulfill all the requirements she needed past that. Um, events coming up. Um, Drupal Camp Asheville starts tomorrow. Uh, tickets are $10. Training is tomorrow and there's going to be uh, contribution training and contribution day in the afternoon and then an unconference in the afternoon um, where people just kind of go and talk and like kind of boff style and then on Saturday will be a full day of sessions and all of that's inclusive for ten dollars and then DrupalCon Global is happening next week virtually and I'm not going to go over all the other things um, this week so we'll talk about all of them next time oh but if you do want to talk at Drupal um, uh, uh, Drupal for Gov, Drupal GovCon, GovCon, their call for papers ends tomorrow and they're going to be virtual. So you don't have to go to Baltimore to present at GovCon this year, but papers close tomorrow for that. Um, Drupal jobs, um, who's hiring, you can always go to jobs.drupal.org. Also, there's a lot of really good jobs on badcamp.org right now. I can't stress that enough. Like a lot of our Bay Area companies are hiring remote positions, a lot of great stuff out there. And then if you are um, uh, looking for work, uh, you can post your resume on jobs.drupal.org or you can ping me because I have a quite extensive list of who's hiring that I always keep. So that's a good place to tap because I like all my Drupal friends and want everyone to be happy and employed. So if you are looking, you can ping me and I have some ideas. Um, coming up for SF Doug, um, our next group meetup will be July 23rd with Danny Englander from Canopy. Um, he's going to cover the basics of getting started with layout building, builder, 
Um, he's going to cover how to get up and run the basics. Um, he'll also delve into the layout buildings, layout builder systems module and how it can um, help with the theming. So that'll be exciting. And that's an early presentation. So it's July 23rd, early in the afternoon for us Pacific folks. It's 3.30 to 5.30. Um, in August, um, the first presenter on August 13th in the evening, 5.30 to 7.30. Um, oh, there's a typo there, but we all know that I'm at 5.30. Um, Hussein Abbas is going to talk about static analysis for your Drupal modules with uh, continuous in integration. Um, he describes his session as, do you read your code before running to make sure that it works? Do you see that variable was initialized? Or if you included a return statement, do you see if the code follows Drupal code standards? If the answers are yes to any of the above, you are statically analyzing your code in your head, but your brain doesn't scale, nor are you capable of checking hundreds of lines of code with every commit. Use your brain for better things and leave static analysis to tools designed for that purpose. Um, and he'll go into some different um, ways you can verify that your code is clean um, by automating versus doing it manually. And I am looking for a speaker for the second part of August, if anyone is interested. Um, I don't have that date in front of me, but it'll be a 3.30 to 5.30 Pacific time slot. Um, so yeah, I'm calling for speakers. Um, so just reach out to me and um, every level of speaker is okay. If um, a bunch of people want to do lightning talks. I can do a round of lightning talks where we have four mini sessions and that's a great way for first time speakers to get um, accustomed to speaking in front of people. And bad camp, everyone's favorite Drupal camp, right? Um, we are looking for volunteers and organizers. Um, there's a few organizer roles that we're looking to fill and with a virtual camp, we're finding that we need more people because it's harder to run a virtual camp than an in-person camp. We need more people um, and uh, more volunteers for sure. And bad camp is October 14th through 17th. And if you want, you can reach out to me, but Valerie at Rooted is the person to talk to about um, volunteering or organizing. And without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Alyssa. Okay, I'll see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Cool. Can everybody see the big red screen? Yep. All right, I'll go into presentation mode. Can you still see it? Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. I have all the, the faces in the right hand corner. Um, so yes, I will be talking about voting API for Drupal 8 and creating a custom contest. Who am I? Alyssa Thomas. I'm a Drupal engineer at Boom Inc., as Amy June said. Um, we're a web agency based in Providence, Rhode Island, so on the East Coast, um, but we're fully distributed. So we were working from home before that became cool. And we serve uh, corporate clients, nonprofits, higher ed, really, and a lot of, a lot of stuff in the sort of Northeast. Um, but maybe we'll get some more West Coast business. All right, table of contents. I'm gonna go over, obviously, the voting API and front-end widgets. Um, I'm gonna discuss a case study. Uh, the client doesn't want me to, you know, they, they don't wanna be named, so I'm going to share a lot of code. It'll be anonymized and I will discuss real requirements, but hopefully I will not actually uh, give a lot of identifying details out. Um, I'll talk about kind of the discovery process and, you know, trying to figure out a good architecting approach, uh, what I actually did, uh, things that trip me up so that hopefully I can have, you know, help all of you avoid that in the future. Um, what our results were, and share a little bit of the open source. 
Um, and if anybody has questions at any time, feel free to jump in. I could probably talk forever, so you can always interrupt. Okay, voting API. Uh, kind of fun to think about elections again, right? Instead of coronavirus. Uh, so this was actually developed for Drupal 4. Um, I talked to people who have used it in 6 and 7, but not really nobody I talked to have used it in Drupal 8, which is why I kind of went on this, this big path of, of uh, learning how to implement it there. So it's actually a framework. It doesn't really expose uh, like voting mechanisms um, in the UI but that can be implemented by contrib modules. Uh, has lots and lots of really helpful code. I really didn't wanna rewrite all of that myself to repurpose it, so you don't have to either. Um, unfortunately, there's not a tremendous amount of documentation, as is the case with almost every Drupal module I've tried to use. Um, here are resources I found. Uh, they were really useful. So I wanted to share those. And this is just from the project page. So voting API helps developers who want to use a standard as API and schema for storing, retrieving, and tabulating votes. It supports rating of any content types, multi-criteria voting, automatic tabulation of results, and it's also uh, lots of different options as well. So you can you know, you can set it to use points or percentages, sums. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty comprehensive when you're looking actually at the, like the result function um, plugins. And efficient caching of results, because it also, uh, it's pretty easy to integrate with views modules. And so you're not having to like recalculate every single time a page loads, for example. So there's a lot of really helpful things about it. Um, and yeah, as I said, this module does not directly expose the voting mechanisms like on the front end. It is a framework. Um, if you want to look at some voting systems, uh, these contrib modules have used voting API the is useful, five star voting API widgets, plus one and voting API reaction. Um, five star, I think is probably the most popular. And in the screen here on the screen, you can see this is using voting API reaction. So it's, you know, a node with the lorem ipsum text. And then um, at the bottom here, you can see the user can click on these reactions and um, there's definitely JavaScript going on, and that will end up rendering it on the page. So that's an example of it leveraging voting API, but the voting API is not adding those little smiley faces. We, we use the five star on our new website, and it does have options for like custom, well, slightly customizing the front end. You can have thumbs up, thumbs down, stars, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, there's there's really a lot of people have done have added to graphics and I think you it makes it pretty easy to add your own plugins. Mm -hmm. uh, voting API widgets. So that's I think actually that's the logo on that project, which I liked. Uh, so this actually just was born with Drupal 8. I was kind of surprised. Um, requires 8.23 or greater. I mean, right now we're all at 8.9, so no worries. Huh. Um, it's at the fifth alpha release. It requires jQuery bar rating plugin. And the two voting plugins, uh, they use five star and is useful. So yeah, as, as that person was saying, um, you can definitely extend it with, you can, you can use your own uh, images. Um, 
thumbs up, thumbs down, hearts, stars, whatever you want. Um, it, it is somewhat limited in that, you know, it's, yeah, the, the functionality doesn't let you stretch it too far out. And so that became the issue for the project that I was assigned because unfortunately they just did not want to go with five stars. And I, I did everything I could to try and sell them on it. So yeah, we had these custom requirements needed to go beyond what was offered with um, five star or any of those other contributed modules. Um, so what the client want, they wanted a drop down field, one to 10 numbers. So that once they have this online contest and then each submission is a node of content and the, the judge who's assigned can just, you know, on the drop down, click, select eight or 10 or five or whatever. That's what they wanted. Um, they wanted, uh, so each time a judge loaded that submission for the first time, the default value should be one. And then every other time the judge loads that submission, the default value should be their last score. So if the judge, you know, maybe they gave it a 10 and they come back the next day and think, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't tip top. So I'm gonna give it a nine instead. But when they load the submission, it should load with 10 as the default, and then they can change it. And the voting has to support multiple judges, obviously, lots and lots of judge. We, we had a specific user role that we added called judge. Uh, and yeah, and lots of lots and lots of submissions. I mean, we're really expecting probably thousands of entries. And um, yeah, like I said, each judge each judge could vote as many times as they felt like it, changing the vote, um, but ultimately the score that was saved for each judge for each submission, they would just have one score. All right, and so with these requirements, I was just, uh, I mean, you know, of course I spun up an instance and, you know, instantly, was downloading five star because it seems like that's the way you implement rating systems with Drupal the easiest. I thought, can I hack the output with jQuery? <laughs> can I like just make these stars turn into drop down? Um, one person on our team was kind of insistent, like maybe we should just we should just make our own voting system. Like just just like custom code it, which you know is totally doable, but uh, we had three months to get this launched. So <laughs> that is another requirement I should have mentioned. Um, you know, someone else suggested maybe we should push back and and we, we did ask them, you know, how wedded are you to this one to 10 drop down? But they were. And so finally, it seemed like um, the most logical approach would be to use voting API and voting API widgets, um, but extend them because it's Drupal 8 modules, you know, everything is namespace, there's base classes that can be overridden, you know, very elegantly and easily with a custom module. So that was, was absolutely the, the winning idea. Checking my time. All right, so how to do this? Um, we created a new content type. We'll just I'll just call it submission for our purposes here. Added new fields, installed the contributed modules we needed, and then I mean the, the bulk of my work as a backend developer um, was to do that extending the contributed uh, modules to make custom, custom voting widgets and plugins. So here's just a sample. And I, I do actually have a working demo 
that I can show at some point. So it's a dog contest. You got your dog name, dog breed, you can rate it. Um, and you can see the, the field that I have here is called score. And so that is gonna be my voting field. And in terms of configuring, um, yeah, with, with voting API widgets um, and also the, I think there's a lot of like five star overlap. So a lot, it, it's interesting. Like there's some code that's actually straight up copied and reproduced between the two of them. So you'll kind of see this for five star and voting API widgets that you can configure stars, bars, different kinds of things. And you get there um, when you're going to manage display for that content type for this field. Just, just to point that out, because I, I don't know, I had a little trouble trying to figure out how all this, all these pieces work together. And then installing and enabling all the modules. I use Composer. And so after I got all those modules, now when I go to add field in my new content type, it, um, because the, the voting API widgets, you know, when you install it, um, the schema and plugins and such supports this new field of type voting API. And so this is my score field and you'll see for field settings, vote type, I just select normal vote, allowed number of values, I'm just saying one. So vote plugin, um, here the options are five star or is useful. Um, so you can, be, the, you can see very clearly just from the UI, like here's my dilemma. I don't wanna use five star voting plugins I want to use my own plugin. So the, the work subsequently is how do I write the code to programmatically create that new plugin that then at the end of the day, I can just drop down, select it, and be good to go. So yeah, the, the main task is to extend the voting API widgets and um, I needed to extend the voting API widget base class. Um, I have links to these. I, I just thought it was, it's super interesting to read contributed module code because, um, you know, people put a lot of work into it. And also if you're gonna, if you're gonna override a contributed module class, it's definitely good to look at it first. So, um, and I also, I, I'm going to include all of my code. And so once you see it, um, I'm just calling it special widget. And the ID is special because it's a very special project. And, um, and so this is for, this is for the widget itself. And that is that issue of, I want the, the one to 10 drop down. So I need to override voting API widget base. Um, and then th that second part of the requirement was that, you know, I needed to override the defaults for when, when the judge loads the page, it should say one or it should have the, the latest judge score, et cetera. So for that, we have to extend uh, this base rating form, which is also in voting API widgets contrib module. And that in itself extends the content entity form. Um, so I had not worked extensively with content entities before. So for me, this was, uh, it, was it was a big learning opportunity. Um, so in voting API, actually the, the vote, vote itself is a custom entity, which makes sense because that way, you know, the entity can be the vote can be manipulated in every way that entities can, um, you know, using entity manager and such. Um, but at any rate, yeah, I override base rating form 
and I just called my class 10 rating form because I'm rating it 1 to 10. And uh, just to point out, um, <laughs> it was really, really weird. So I was looking at five star and how they did it and stuff. This one to 10 drop down, it's actually just done in the annotation of the class. So like no actual code in like, you know, the build form or submit form methods or anything like that. Just no. Nope. So annotation, I just, there's that um, array or object or whatever with 10 options. So I thought pointing that out was interesting because it's actually pretty easy. Uh, the 10 rating form class, uh, that was a lot more work, <laughs> much more work. Um, I, yeah, I'm not going to go through that entire file and I don't have the little snippet to point out, um, but there is a build form method. And so when it came to overriding the defaults, um, what I did was, you know, change out what was there for default value in the form. And then there was also an attributes data default value. And um, so I was able to override it that way. And I don't know, it, it was somewhat complicated because I had to actually, I had to actually add a custom plugin for voting API as well, because uh, the calculations were a little different from what they offered to what we specifically needed. Um, and so there's, you know, dependency injection services, all kinds of madness in this. Um, what I put in GitHub is, is definitely kind of abridged, but it still works. Um, okay, so I did write all that code, um, you know, checked it, linted it, everything looked exactly how it should, went through with my debugger and all the values were correct. Um, the only thing was when I was in the user interface, you know, trying to load that score field settings, my custom voting plugin was not appearing. So, so here you go. I will present my solutions so that no one will ever have to deal with this grief ever again. Um, so it turns out actually that voting API widgets, um, when it's matching, it's like, I know, it loads the plugin manager and it ends up in a loop matching all of its plugins with, with different content entity forms. And the way that it like hooks up with that base rating form class is in, uh, they use a hook entity type build. So, I mean, in this module, it's voting API widgets entity type build. Um, so I had to override it. So basically I did the same thing um, in my custom module. And my custom module I'm naming for this example is my module. <laughs> so I just do a my module entity type build. And then instead of, you know, instead of using base rating form, I just override. So I'm using my 10 rating form. And so I thought that was good to go and still not getting results. Um, I didn't realize that there was an order of operations here. So maybe, maybe a lot of you have already dealt with this before, but I had never been in the situation where like I called up, you know, I had a, a hook in my module, my custom module, and it wasn't being called. It just was confusing. And so, yeah, I went through with my debugger and it just turned out it was being called, but because there were these two entity type build hooks, mine was getting called and then the entity type build hook for the voting API widgets module was getting called last. Um, because they were kind of weighted to be last. Uh, this was kind of more important. So um, turns out that I had to use this hook module implements alter to basically like force, <laughs> force mine to be called last instead. 
so that I could, you know, then have my entity type build hook, um, yeah, called at the, the right time. And then, and then that did actually work. Um, last thing, I was just doing all my testing as a super admin user because why not? I'm user one, everything works for me. And then when I, I ended up, you know, creating this new role, I created new users. None of them were able to access any of the voting API widgets. What was going on? Permissions, obviously. I'm sure you, I'm sure you are always are aware of that. It, uh, it's always like the last step for me. Like, what is happening? Permissions. So we were able to launch on time, which was great because there were lots of press releases and everything was totally set. So that would have been pretty bad to not do that. Um, yeah, and there were lots and lots of votes cast, no data loss whatsoever. So yeah, I could definitely say the, the voting API in terms of you know, how it manages the data coming in was stellar. Um, there were never any miscalculations. We did, we actually had about maybe even two or three weeks of pretty solid QA testing um, because, you know, the, the client was, was very concerned, obviously, to make sure, especially with these cases of, like, the judge can vote, you know, 40 times, but it should only count that last score and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it, that all worked flawlessly, and that was nothing that we needed to do it was just voting api like just handled that um i i looked today actually because i was really curious i was like i was just curious like how often did the judges vote and on average each judge voted seven times so they voted and then they changed their mind six times to vote again just thought that was interesting And so, yeah, once, uh, once I had added that custom plugin with the code, then I was able to, in the field settings, look at that, my special plugin shows up. So that's good. And now there's that score field and it's got a one through 10, so you can vote on it. That's good. This just, that just shows one of the tables. The uh, voting API framework, it, when you install it, it adds two new tables. One is called voting API vote, and one is voting API result. Uh, the voting API vote actually stores every single row is a vote. So yeah, like that example of the judge who votes seven times, there's gonna be seven rows. It's gonna have the judge's user ID. It's gonna have the, the node ID. It's gonna have the score, obviously. And then that second table, the voting API result table, um, that's gonna have kind of different functions. So voting API will calculate uh, the sum of all the votes, the averages, things like that. And, and I, I did create a custom function for that because there just wasn't, it, it seemed like it had a lot of stuff, but then when it came down to it, it's like, oh, well, my exact use case is not covered here. So you, you can override that pretty easily or, or add to it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so that, that's the voting API vote table. So yeah, you can just see all the votes. Um, this was actually my demo example. So I had the admin user and two additional users, same NID, which is the first piece of content. So it was one and all their scores. And you can see the, that entity type is called vote. Um, here's what my code looks like. You can also see it on GitHub. So, yeah, I've got the dot module file for the hooks that I had to invoke. Obviously the info YAML for just creating the, 
the module, um, services YAML for my dependency injection. Um, for the plugin, there's my um, my custom voting plugin. Um, in this vote result function, that was where I had to extend the voting API functions itself, and the form is is overriding the, the widget form. So I don't know. It kind of seems like a lot of code to do not that much work, but I feel like that is just what Drupal 8 does. <laughs> it's like, here you go, 20, fi 20 files. Um, so here is my code. And I, I did also write a blog post, so it's not going to include a different story. It's the same story, but you know, it's written out. It's more details. So that is really all I have to say. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to see what it looks like. I can also show that. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, what was the mechanism for people reviewing the results? Did you just build like an admin view of, of those entities or something like that? Good question. Yeah. Uh, I know it's funny because yeah, when I when I made my demo site today, I was like, oh wait, but there's no yeah, there's no transparency. Like I can see it in the database, but you know, who's gonna do that? Yeah, so uh oh and I should say with this project, um so we actually used web form and web form content creator, um, which is really helpful because I don't know, I always wanna just like make a custom form and you know, make programmatic everything. Um but you know, Webform makes it really easy. And um, I worked pretty closely side by side with the front end engineer on my team. So he, you know, would be like making pretty dramatic style changes. And then I can just pull all, you know, and it was really just like one uh, config YAML file for Webform, which is really cool. So I would just like pull this branch and load that and kind of be working just on my stuff totally in the back end. So yeah, he created um, a few different views. I guess one was just for like, like each user basically, like if the user is a judge, like in, in that judge role, then when the, the judge, or when you go to user login and log in, there's actually like a block view that displays and it will just have all of the submissions. So like, cause, Maybe they were even assigned or something, but it'd be basically like, here are the things that you need to vote for. So that was helpful because then the judge can just click on each link. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and then there'd be an admin view. So um, I guess there were, you know, at the top, some, some people that wanted to kind of see, um, especially uh, like ranking and stuff. Like, okay, we've got thousands of submissions. Like, who's getting the best scores because they're going to be the winners of this contest. And so, yeah, there is a view for that. Um, and that's where you can start to integrate, uh, like the views and, and something like five star integrates really well. Um, when you create a custom voting widget, doesn't integrate at all. So I, I actually ended up using a hook pre render view and like you know basically like took the stuff from the database that score and just shoved it into the view so it's like the front end engineer built the view and then i added the database content and i don't know we because we were kind of under a time pressure it seemed like there had to be a saner way to do that but it literally was just like the thing that occurred to us to do <laughs> If anyone else has ideas, I would definitely be open to hearing them. But yeah, that was how we uh, we were displaying, you know, all the scores. And I think even later on, um, there was another request to kind of have more of an aggregate aggregated view, such that you know, basically like we're not sure if the judges are actually judging. So they would list like the judge and their submissions. And if the score is zero, like 
it would list all this. So, so uh, views played a, a big role there. Very cool. Thank you so much. It's really, really interesting. Yeah, part of why I wanted to share, I mean, the, the biggest reason was I just thought if anybody ever wants to do an online contest with Drupal, there's not a lot of documentation. So now here is some, um, but also just be, uh, just, I hadn't really done a whole lot of like really like bending a, a different module to my will before. So I just thought it could be helpful um, if you, if you look at the code if you haven't done that, a lot of that before, it um, can offer some some more ideas because there's a lot of tutorials and stuff, and and sometimes sometimes it can just be very technical and very high level, and it's kind of nice to just have a concrete example to follow through. That's what I got. 6.45, so that was a lot of talking. But. I, have a, I have a question. <laughs> uh -huh. How long did it take you to, to maybe like from beginning to end of this project, what, what time frame do you think you spent? Uh, well, we had three months and we definitely used three months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I feel is a pretty compressed timeline. Um, uh-huh. Thank God we, we did we did have time for testing, so that was really great. <laughs> oh, cool. Did you use or were you able to use anything from the five star module? Because you like installed it and then you just replaced it, or like because five star had like some reporting features and stuff. Were you able to use any, any of that? I think I would have if I had taken the time. Yeah, because the type of yeah, the reporting and like working with the views, uh -huh. I, th I think would be useful. Right. But I um, basically right. just, well, we did uh, for that aggregated view, um, it, it did work with five stars, like displaying of scores, because like five star, I think it has like this big views plugin. So yeah, basically when, yeah, when you go to the view, you can select like uh, I, yeah, like totals and things like that. Yeah, which is super helpful. Part of why we had to kind of deviate from five star was just because we had um, we had multiple judges voting on like each entry. Mm -hmm. So sometimes like the total, the total would sometimes be all of the votes. And so if each judge voted seven times because they were changing their mind, you know, they're just refining their vote or whatever, um, the actual total would be huge versus- Scale it back based on how many times a single person voted essentially. Yeah, yeah, so that's why I ended up writing a function that, I mean, you know, it, it just in the database basically is like, get me the most recent row from, mm -hmm. <laughs> this user and this NID. I see. Yeah, because otherwise total, you know, if, if the judge voted like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, you know, the total would be big, whereas maybe it should just be six. That's that's the number. Okay. But yeah, it's cool. I, I would really like to play around with five star because um, I did just, a you know, for a, a few days, like during this discovery period, but pretty early on, it was like, all right, <laughs> pick something, start something. And so I, I and, and also there, there wasn't like a ton of tutorial content on Five Star either. I'd love to see one. Yeah, I noticed that too. It was basic Drupal 101. <laughs> Where's the documentation? Yeah. <laughs> Drupalize Me, I believe, actually had a whole video series for ranking and voting. Um, and I don't think I paid to see it, but I, I did see that they had some. Mm -hmm. So that, that, yeah, that was a great resource. And then there, there were some uh, doc, yeah, there's the people had, you know, made blog posts or, or things for using five star in Drupal seven. So really just, I, I just kept hitting this wall where it's like, 
like, who's doing this in Drupal 8? Like, aren't we all using Drupal 8 now? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Uh, it was good to hear you say that you find the API documentation kind of hard because I, I find it really, it's, I don't want to say it's unhelpful. Once you know what like property or method or whatever is, is, is your, you know, your, your, the thing you need, then the documentation is ample, but I find discovering what I need like to be almost impossible. And so, you know, I, I think I do what a lot of us do. It's just like, I Google it, just hoping, please God, mm -hmm. let there be some example or some blog somebody's written. Uh, even if it's not even that similar to what I'm doing, it, it could just point me to the right method or the right, but like, I don't quite understand how I'm supposed to discover these things, you know? It, Sometimes what I end up doing is I sleuth other modules, like, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll like, yep. oh, I, I need to do something and then I'll find a module that does sort of what I wanted it to do and then I sleuth their module and I'm like, oh, okay, they're using these hooks and these like these things that, you know, it's either a hook now or it's a dependent, like whatever else, the, uh, what's the other method in Drupal 8 for like triggering, triggering an event basically. And then I and then I go okay I'll try to use that and then that sometimes leads me to the but yeah the documentation at least the the developer documentation isn't that useful I find yeah that's a that's a good technique Eric and I think the other thing that I sometimes do and sometimes it's helpful sometimes not so helpful is um, like like the other day I was struggling with book API. And I actually just finally broke down and looked in the test folder in the book core module itself. And then sometimes the tests have some clues. Yes, absolutely. That, that has been really helpful. So that, that's sometimes, like something that says better than the API docs themselves, which is like, Yeah, wow. usually, usually <laughs> if the test is written well, it's going to tell you exactly what's supposed to happen. Right. It, no. it, 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 the tests have to do a lot of the things that you're often trying to do yourself, you know, like, like, how do I retrieve a list of book chapters or something? And then you're like, oh, okay, well, the tester had to figure this out. So why don't I just do, do what they did? <laughs> but yeah, wow. It, it's definitely not easy. It's definitely like you're playing like forensic expert or something to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I relied just so heavily on using PHP Storm, just stepping through. And and actually what I, I, I think I was getting really hung up on because there's so much uh, JavaScript. So like, especially in Five Star. So it's oh, like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going through, I'm going through, I'm great. And then all of a sudden, like the user clicks and what happened? <laughs> what does it do? Right. <laughs> uh, don't make me add console.log statements here. Does anyone have any other questions? If not, I'm going to stop the recording. No. Okay, I'm going to stop.